Welcome everybody to Tuesdays to Your Health. We're, I'm really delighted today to have Caitlin Moore with me. Um, we're here at the gorgeous Cavallo Point Lodge here at the, at the Healing Arts Center and Spa. And I'm Dr. Brad Jacobs with Blue Wave Medicine. We do this uh, every month and it's really an honor to have, to have Caitlin here. So we thought we would uh, get started. Um, we'll have a series of questions with the, with the intention of the um, of our conversation here today is really focused on brain health and, um, and really trying to get a look at you know, through the decades as we go from our 40s to our 50s into our 80s and 90s, um, what happens to our ability to sort of parallel process, to have sort of uh, be bright, responsive, engaging, and how can we sort of reduce our cognitive decline and optimize our, our health here? So without further ado, let me get started. Um, Kaylin, thanks for joining us. Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah. So um, maybe tell us, give us a little bit of background about yourself. I'd love to hear, you told me your story, but I'd love, I think the audience would yeah. love to hear it too. Yeah, so um, my name's Caitlin Moore. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist. And what that means is I am a specialist in the brain. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist by training who's done extended training, specifically looking at um, different conditions that affect the brain, including uh, different neurodegenerative diseases. So primarily diseases that happen later in life. Uh, so I specialize in the assessment, diagnosis, and then uh, treatment of those conditions. That's great. And how long have you been in the Bay Area? I mean, t talk about, yeah. I'll let you so, all about the East Coast, West Coast. Yeah, sort of so, biases and um, I did my, uh, all of my graduate training on the, on the East Coast. So I did most of my training in Boston through the Harvard Medical System. My um, doctorate's from Boston University. Um, and then I came out here for our, our version of residency. I was down at the VA Palo Alto Stanford Healthcare System. I was there for a couple of years. Uh, and then I slowly started to creep up north. I got to San Francisco. I did a two-year uh, residency specializing in Alzheimer's disease at the um, Ray Dolby Brain Health Center. And then I kept crawling north, and I got to Marin County. Um, and I've been here since 2017. Um, so I started the California Brain Health Center um, at that time, and then we've grown over the years. And we uh, also have uh, satellite clinics out in Napa and into uh, South Lake Tahoe. Yeah, you've really expanded. Yeah, it's great. Going. There's a lot of demand. Yes. Um, so hopefully you guys will be excited too, and maybe you want to um, go and visit her her shop. And she's got a whole bunch of great neuropsychologists that, that were yes. with her. So, well, let's get into it a little bit. I'm I'm most curious, and I think a lot of people here are probably curious about what is memory loss. What are the different conditions that are sort of class categorized under when people lose their memory? Um, and maybe speaking to you know we know the term Alzheimer's. Um, what does that mean? Uh, how does that fall within the concept of what people call dementia? Maybe speak yeah. in a little bit. Um, I would say probably the the most popular question we get in our office is what is the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Is it dementia? Is it Alzheimer's? Uh, what is it? Um, the reality is dementia is just a clinical description of severity of symptoms. So dementia just means that someone has had changes in thinking significant enough um, that they now need more help in daily life. So they're forgetting to pay their bills. They're not managing their finances very well. Maybe they're double paying bills or forgetting bill payments altogether. Uh, they're getting lost while driving or having accidents. Um, so when it reaches that threshold, then we say, okay, this person has dementia. Um, but there are a lot of different causes of dementia, over 200 different causes of dementia, with the most common being Alzheimer's disease. So um, the vast majority of the time, some studies suggest up to 80% of um, cases of dementia are due to Alzheimer's disease. Um, because of that, the two terms often get used interchangeably. Um, it's not quite accurate, but because they're so prevalent, um, that's why we often will say, oh, she has Alzheimer's or she has dementia. Um, but there are other kinds of dementia. Uh, Parkinson's disease can produce a dementia. Um, stroke can produce a dementia. Huntington's disease can produce a dementia. Um, a lot of different diseases, but also there are reversible causes of dementia as well. So you can have abnormal um, lab levels, for example. Some people will um, develop a dementia-like syndrome after a surgery. Um, so not all dementia is progressive. Not all dementia is related to a disease, but most of the time Alzheimer's disease is highest in likelihood. Yeah, and I think you had a slide, um, you might be able to put up that, that second slide I have here. It shows like the different types of, the, of uh, dementia that you just listed. So I think that, that would be helpful that we put up. Yeah. So. Um, and then for, for the group here, we'll just speak into it as, as we talk about it to give you a little bit more 
background. So how about that? If we think about the genetic contribution versus lifestyle, um, how much do genes play a role, family history and genetics play a role in, in memory loss? So memory loss specifically, most of us will experience some changes in our memory as we get older, and that is normal. And so I want to also separate the idea of memory loss from abnormal aging. There's normal aging where we change how, how we learn and remember information changes a little bit. That's OK. That's not a disease. That's just us getting older. Um, and then there's um, something different where we develop memory loss that's more serious and often more rapid. When that happens, it almost always suggests that there's a disease process present, um, really regardless of age. Uh, and so after 65, genes play a role, but genes typically aren't the primary factor. Um, Alzheimer's disease, again, I think will probably be the focus of, of these conversations because it's so prevalent, but um, Alzheimer's disease after 65 isn't highly, highly genetic. If you have a family history of it, your uh, odds go up somewhat, um, but lifestyle seems to play a much bigger role, uh, much more than we ever used to, to think in the past. Um, even lifestyle in your 40s and 50s. So I'm not talking about lifestyle in your 70s. This is a, a lifespan condition. The damage we accrue over time contributes to our risk as we get older. Yeah. Um, but certainly before age 65, memory loss uh, earlier in life it has a very strong genetic component. Yeah. So you're, if I hear you right, you're saying like if you're in your 50s and you have accelerated memory loss, there's probably a genetic yeah. component to that. Yeah. Most likely um, one of your parents had the same condition. Yeah. And I know there's a few different genes that are account for um, memory loss that we know of. And do you know what proportion of people in their 40s, 50s, let's say, that have memory loss, we can say, oh, yeah, you have one of these genes that we already know about, or are there are a lot of genes we still don't know about? So we, there are a lot of genes that we do know about that are considered um, contributory, um, meaning that we know that they play a role to some degree, but they're not deterministic. So if you have it, it doesn't necessarily play a role. The most common that we've all heard of is APOE. Um, that's the one that's in most of the commercial genetic testing. It's also the one that is most widely talked about. Um, that is not one of the um, genes that is contributing to these uh, early onset cases. So there are three genes uh, presenilin 1, presenilin 2, and then APP, all of these genes impact um, how amyloid is developed and processed in the brain. Um, under 5% of cases of Alzheimer's disease have uh, an early onset condition. And so um, the vast majority of the time, 95% of the time, we're thinking after 65, less of a genetic component. Yeah. Okay, great. So if they're younger, odds are it's a genetic component, maybe one of these three genes you mentioned. Yes. Um, so if it's not genes, what is it? And so I'll say it probably is a little bit of genes. Almost all medical conditions, almost all um, psychiatric conditions have this um, duality of you probably have some sort of genetic dis uh, contribution that predisposes you, but then there's something else in your life that turns those genes on or brings those genes out. Um, so lifestyle, it plays a really big role. Um, and there are a lot of different conditions that I know that we'll talk about that go into that, but um, most of them involve um, your heart health, uh, sensory health, um, socializing, intellectual engagement. Um, so there's a lot of things that we have control over and then a, a few things that we, we don't have as much control over. Yeah. Okay, great. So lifestyle. So in other words, what we do and how we behave. So my recollection is, so when you think about memory, there's modifiable and non-modifiable. Yeah. So the ones that aren't modifiable age. Yes, age. Or chronological age. We'll talk about biological age later. Um, gender but yeah. that you're born with. Yes. Um, your genes, so the ge genetic influences. Mm -hmm. Anything else that's really non-modifiable? No, I mean, those are definitely the three, at least that we know of. I'll say this is a growing area. So there are a lot of things that probably relate to risk that we don't know about. But right now, age is by far the biggest risk factor for, for Alzheimer's disease or dementia above and beyond any kind of genetic contribution. But then, yeah, the female sex. Um, females get Alzheimer's disease twice as often as men. Yeah, um, so that, that. Yeah, so that's a, a bit of a bummer for all of us in the crowd. Um, that is a it's been a long um, puzzle that we've been trying to, to figure out for a, a long time. The hypothesis was that, well, hey, women just live longer. Um, and there's just a confound here that women outlive men. Age is the biggest risk factor. So, of course, women are going to get it more. 
Um, men have been um, eating away at that gap. Men have been living longer than they used to, and yet women are still developing it at twice twice the rate. And so it doesn't seem like it's just um, age in, the, in that situation. Yeah. So I understand there's some research going on at Cornell where they're looking at some of this, and they're looking at estrogen receptors and how the modulation of as women go through menopause, that you get down regulation of glucose metabolism related to the changes in estrogen. Yeah. Do you know much about that? Or? Yeah, and it, it's, uh, I mean, there, there are several things that have been hypothesized there. One is just how um, how glucose changes, how it's processed in the brain during menopause, regardless of when you go through menopause. Do you go through it early, go through it late? Um, but then there are also other factors that are likely contributing. Um, so we know that sleep gets dysregulated. And so there's probably an interaction between sleep and glucose. Uh, we know that stress levels rise. So there's probably an inflammatory component to it. Uh, and so we know that women's brains tend to age faster after menopause, yeah. and it can contribute to this extended risk. Uh, this is still very much an area of pretty early research, uh, yeah. so much so that they, for a while, they were looking at uh, hormone replacement therapy that has not been recommended at this point. Um, there hasn't really been any meaningful evidence to show that hormone replacement would change the trajectory, um, at least in the large scale studies. But there, there is currently research going on about that. Yeah, I, so I, was gonna, I wanted to lean into that a little bit because yeah. I think if the hypothesis that glucose modulation or sorry, estrogen modulation affects um, sort of energy utilization in the brain or glucose, mm -hmm. measured by glucose and like PET scans. Um, you would think that hormone replacement therapy um, might improve or mitigate that decrement that you're seeing because you now have more estrogen in the system. And if, if that's what's happening at the estrogen receptor level, that that would be modulated. So I don't think, I don't know of research that's happened yet that's looking at the current um, formulations of estrogen, progesterone, yeah. you know, hormone replacement therapy to look at that yet. Yeah. Um, there's old data, I'm wondering, and I'm curious, the other thing that would be interesting to look at is if you compared folks um, that were taking hormone replacement therapy like everyone was before 2000 when the Women's Health Study was mm -hmm. released, so many women were, and you look at sort of what's it look like for them X years out comparing it to a cohort that then wasn't, you know, matured through menopause and didn't take estrogen because many gynecologists don't recommend it up yeah. until now. It's changing back, thankfully, but I'd be interested to see if there's differences in the rates of dementia. So that would be like an indirect way to look yeah. at that? Yeah, they've looked at it. They've looked at cognition. Um, so looking more on a fluid scale of how fast do you process information? How well do you remember information? So not in a clinical diagnostic sense. Yeah. Um, and they haven't found really compelling research yeah. either way, but it could be just that they're not following it long enough or that um, for most uh, most studies show that Alzheimer's disease is probably brewing in the brain for like a decade before it's symptomatic. And yeah. so for almost all of these studies, we're realizing we started measuring things just way too late. Uh, and so it, were we wrong in how we measured it or did we just measure it too long into the process? Yeah. Okay. So. That's one category. I think it's really an interesting one, particularly for women. Yeah. Um, and then thinking about metabolic health. So yeah. uh, what's the role of metabolic health um, on on memory, on brain health? Yeah, I would say the, the first, so it, uh, just overall, anything that affects your heart is going to affect your brain, um, whether that's um, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your smoking, your alcohol use, anything that has a negative effect to the heart is going to impact the blood vessels. You have blood vessels in your brain. Your brain is going to be affected by that as well. Um, and so we know that high cholesterol, high, high blood pressure, heart disease, all of those conditions are strongly associated with different kinds of dementia um, really across the board. If you have damage in the blood vessels in your brain, it just turns the dial up as to how fast these other diseases will progress. Um, diabetes in particular seems to have a special relationship with Alzheimer's disease. We don't totally know why that is. Um, but we know that the majority of people with Alzheimer's disease have some sort of impaired glucose regulation. Many of them have a diagnosis of um, diabetes. Um, we also know that earlier you get diabetes, the higher your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, the more poorly managed your di diabetes, even greater risk. Um, so we know that there is a link there. It is so strong that they've considered, um, they called diabetes, or they called Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes mm -hmm. um, because of just how strong the connection is. Yeah. 
So, and the role of insulin, I think, is really interesting mm -hmm. as it relates to the risk of dementia or memory loss, cognitive decline in general. Yeah, insulin resistance. For a long time, that was something that was not really studied as much because it was considered kind of a byproduct of some of these other conditions. Um, but it seems how our brain metabolizes insulin, the the how the brain uses insulin for various thinking processes is different in these different dementias. Uh, and we see that on imaging. So a lot of the imaging um, studies that we do relies on measuring um, metabolic uptake and, 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 and how the brain's working. Yeah. So what is the thinking? So the more insulin you have in the circulation, that will it's, lead to... Yeah, it's the sweet spot because we know that having too much is a problem and we know that having too little is a problem. Um, and different diseases will kind of turn the dial up. And we see this with type 1 diabetes as well, right? The um, type 1 diabetes high insulin levels and low insulin levels, both are predictive of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it doesn't, it's not clear, I would say the relationship at this point, but we know that how the brain handles insulin is something breaks um, yeah. and, it, and it seems to, to predict risk. Yeah, it's interesting. I have a different view. I mean, my, my at least the way I was trained was hypoglycemic events, low, low sugar events are really bad for yes. the brain. Very. Um, and so someone doses himself with too much insulin, their glucose levels go too low in type 1 diabetics, and then they have multiple low glycemic events, and then they're at increased risk. Yeah. Similarly, on the other side, if you have too much insulin around in response to having so much sugar around, like type 2 diabetics, which is a different scenario, because yeah. you're, you're, you're actually making your own endogenous insulin in response to an external requirement demand of all this glucose um, and I guess you know there's two sides we always were taught that too much glucose around affects uh, blood vessels affects the nerves causes ner it leads to neuropathy yep. leads to uh, you know macular de de degeneration or, or I'm sorry retinopathy in the eye and similarly problems in the brain um, and then what's the role of insulin I think of insulin as growth mm -hmm. so you know, it can, it can in, uh, in theory enhance inflammation enhance uh, cancer growth, uh, and accelerate cardiovascular disease, again, related to, yeah. to your point, brain health. So uh, that's my understanding of sort of the role of insulin, but I wonder if other research has showed something differently. No, I, I think right now the, the relationship between insulin and these different diseases is just not well understood, in yeah. part because it's not clear the cause versus consequence, um, because we know that a lot of these conditions tend to go both ways. Um, People who have diabetes before they have Alzheimer's disease, their their diabetes tends to get worse after they develop the condition, right? Because of things like, hey, you're not eating as well as you used to because you're not able to control this as well as you used to. You're not um, exercising like you wanted to. So there are, it, it doesn't seem like right. it's probably one direction. I think right. is the point is, and that's the chicken or the egg situation. I think it's probably the chicken and the egg. Yeah. Well, let's talk about exercise. Yeah. That's a big, important piece. So maybe we can, I'm curious in the room, how many people exercise more than once a week? So we've got, all right, 70% of the crews exercise more than once a week. How about, let's go to the other extreme. How about daily? Okay, we got 50, 60% of the folks in the room. That's impressive. Okay, how, how many people just don't like to exercise? Well, I know some of you like to, but may not be able to. There's a difference. And I know some of you that work exercise regularly claim that you don't like it. I think in the back of the room over there, but they do it anyway, because they know it's good for them. So speak into yeah. the role of exercise and our health in particular, our brain health. Yeah, so exercise is so important. Um, it's just one of the very few activities that we have full, complete control of. Um, and Exercise is something that is fairly dose dependent. The more you do, the better. And I think that that should actually be empowering um, because it, then it, it doesn't mean that you do need to exercise every day. If you can, that's great. But if it means just going from zero days to one day, that's good too. And I think that that's really important that when we're thinking about these different conditions, we're really thinking about risk reduction. We're not talking about, can you prevent it altogether, um, black or white? This is really about what can you do? What is in your control? Um, so exercise is something that has is, is been uh, a topic of, of research for a long time um, because we know that exercise is great for the heart. Again, everything that's good for the heart is going to be good for the brain. 
Um, but it seems also that exercise does have some specific neuroprotective effects as far as neurogenesis. So being able to build new brain cells, build new pathways. Um, so I think there's a direct and an indirect benefit here. Uh, as far as the specific types, I, patients always ask, well, what, what exactly do I need to do? And I would be lying if, we, if I said that we know. Uh, it does seem that um, intensity matters. So moderate intensity, at least getting your heart rate elevated. So um, I have some patients who I say, oh, you know, how much, how much exercise are you getting? And they'll say, well, you know, I'm, I walk around the house all day or I have my post, my, my mailbox is, is like way down at the end of the street. It's good, right? You want to be moving, but it's not the same. You want to really be getting your heart rate up, getting your, your blood vessels um, activated. Um, so moderate intensity, you know, a few times a week if you can. But again, um, I this is a, a situation where you don't want to get into a position where you say, okay, well, I said I was going to exercise for 30 minutes today. I now only have 20 minutes, so I, I can't exercise. So I think that is such a, a, a mental trap that a lot of us fall into. Um, there was an interesting study done um, down at UCSF that looked at um, women who walk, just like as part of their life, women, um, how many city blocks that you walked. And they found that the women who walked the most city blocks in the day declined at a slower rate than the women who walked the fewest. Um, so these aren't even really intentional exercise programs. It's just looking at women who are walking in their daily life. The more you do, the better. Um, so I think that that's something that we should all just keep in mind is um, remove the pressure. Just do what you can. Yeah. That study was a while ago. Too, it was right? a while ago. Yeah. And yeah. And just... it's it's a, such a, a foundation, though, I think, for behavior change, yeah. because I think that that is almost the, the biggest part of exercise is changing behaviors and changing habits. It's a hard thing to do. Yeah. I think for exercise, what's interesting, um, like, fortunately, now we have technology. So you have your phones, your phones tell you how many steps you do. How accurate it is is questionable, but it's relatively accurate. Yeah. And we always tell people, you know, aim for 10,000 steps a day, right? So what does that look like? How many minutes is that? Does anyone know? How many minutes does it take you to walk 10,000 steps in a day? Any guesses? Yeah, it's about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how quickly you walk. Um, so you can do that over the course of a day. There was a great study that looked at the difference between 45 minute exercise and doing three times a day, 15 minutes each. And they found there was actually a study amongst, I think they were 70 years old and older, and they found no difference in cardiovascular outcomes between those two, they were actually equal. So whether you did it 15 minutes, three times a day walking or 45 minutes all at once. So get it in through the day, to your yeah. point. If you got 29 minutes, do it and then do one minute later, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So then the other question I'm curious about is strength training versus yeah. cardiovascular training, cardiorespiratory training. And I think there's, tell me, is there any data on that yet? There is, this is very growing. I'll say also the literature is very muddy. Um, so uh, it does seem, I think for a lot of conditions that uh, having some sort of strength basis to your exercise regimen does seem to matter. And this goes um, beyond just Alzheimer's disease. If we look at movement-based conditions like Parkinson's disease, uh, all of these neurodegenerative diseases do eventually address um, the motor system, and the stronger we build that up, the more robust we are to fight that. Um, as far as how it relates to specific rates of neurodegeneration, I think that that piece of it is a little less clear. Um, most research suggests that the um, best exercise for you is the one that you'll do. Yeah. So that is what I tell patients. Um, if you don't like swimming, it doesn't matter if it's the best. If you're not going to do it, it doesn't matter. Um, so I would say find something that you like to do, something that you maybe will more likely do. Uh, and ideally, you know, if you can have a balance between the two, I think it's beneficial um, because, it, again, it's just teaching the brain different pathways. Um, but if you're not going to exercise, if it means you need to walk, then you should find a different activity. Yeah, that's great. I, tell me about, I know there's some research looking at Tai Chi. Yeah. Uh, love to hear. I personally have done martial arts since I was a kid. I do Tai Chi as well. I found it really beneficial for in many different levels. And I'd love to hear you, you know, your understanding of that research. Yeah, I mean, I think that's amazing that you do. I, I was just thinking on my drive over here, my, when I turn 50, that is going to be the hobby I pick up. Because I think about if you, had to, if you did have to pick one exercise, that probably is most widely encompassing of all of these different skill sets. It probably is Tai Chi, which is a little bit, it's not a mainstream um, uh, exercise here in the United States. 
Um, but I think that the benefits of Tai Chi extend beyond physical activity. Physical activity is part of it, but also you're having to learn new movements in space. Um, you're having to, you're using physical strength. Um, there's a lot of benefits on mood. There's a lot of benefits on balance. So almost all of the systems that we know get impacted in really any of the dementias it touches. Oh. Um, so it, I think it is the most comprehensive. Um, it is also one that is not um, super popular here yet, but I know that that's growing. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of uh, Tai Chi groups for people who already have dementia um, mm -hmm. because of what we know about helping with balance, helping with mood regulation. Um, so I, I think that Tai Chi is great. Um, and if, if there's one thing you want to look into when you go home, it's Tai Chi. Yeah, great. So, yeah. Uh, what I so you mentioned there's a social piece. You people come together. Loneliness we'll talk about and that the relationship between that. Okay. You have balance, and there's been studies looking at it for fall risk, for hip fracture risk, all reducing hip fracture, fall risk. People do tai chi. They look at blood pressure as well. It's been looked at for tai chi, showing reduction in blood pressure. We know that's mm -hmm. related to vascular dementia. Um, and then you have sort of this isometric process where you're moving in slow motion using body weight only but it's really actually quite challenging if you ever do it just move very slowly in space and maybe lifting one leg up as you're stepping out is really much more complicated than it looks and to be to sort of respond to dr morris comment so i did martial arts since i was eight and when i was in my 30s or so they wanted me to learn tai chi i had no interest in learning tai chi because i wanted to be much more active and vigorous and when I hit about 45, is when I finally settled okay. enough to pick up my <laughs> So there's hope. <laughs> yes. So there, there's hope. That's great. So um, just looking back, I wanted to touch on alcohol. Yeah. And just mention that uh, I'd love to get your, your view. But when I was trained in medical school, we learned that a little bit of alcohol is actually good for you. And we think there's some cardiovascular benefits to that. And we knew that um, actually doing a lot of alcohol was not good but a little bit, you know, doing none. So therefore none isn't so good for you and a lot isn't so good for you. And there's a sweet spot in the middle. And now we actually re reviewed the data to realize actually in that cohort of people that wasn't drinking or people that aren't drinking because they're so sick for other reasons that they're not drinking, they were former alcoholics and therefore they're abstaining. And so overall those people, it's a group of people amongst healthy people that may not drink, but this is other mm -hmm. contaminated group, if you will. So now the new view, and I'm curious if you have a different yeah. one, is um, less alcohol is better, none is even is best. And I'm curious about your view on that as yeah. it relates to brain health. Yeah, it, when I, early in my grad, graduate training too, that was the thought that um, a little bit of alcohol seems to be most beneficial if you had to choose one. But as we see with all of these nutritional um, studies, it's very hard to isolate a single ingredient or a single behavior. Um, and so the, the, the research has always been very muddy. Um, the research has never been strong enough to recommend people should start drinking if they don't. And so that was always what we used to tell patients is um, the research suggests that maybe a little bit of drinking, a little bit being defined as like a drink um, for most women. And they've even changed it for men. It used to be two drinks for men and then they changed it to one. Um, so a drink most nights in a week, um, that does seem to be changing course a little bit. Um, I think that this is a, another situation where probably genetics and epigenetics is going to play a role. Probably for some people, alcohol is actually really bad. And we see this with APOE4, um, that almost all kinds of environmental toxins or stressors, people who have this APOE4 gene seem to really have a response to. Yeah. So my guess is that within that, subgroup there's probably people who having a little bit of alcohol is perfectly fine and maybe is beneficial and in that subgroup probably having a little bit is actually worse right um so I, I i bet we will have to splice it down even further yeah it's interesting and my understanding is this one of the recent studies was over 20 drinks a week i think it increased your risk by about 30 yeah. percent yeah and um and then smoking i think increased your risk by 60 percent smoking is terrible for you yeah <laughs> yeah i don't i mean i don't think we need this research to tell you that but um, the good news with smoking is it does seem that e even if you st stop now, your risk goes down. And so it doesn't, it's not one of those, uh, well, I'm doomed. Um, it does seem like you have the potential to change your risk. Yeah. Um, but smoking, as it relates to Alzheimer's disease, tends to be ext extremely bad. 
So you mentioned APO. Mm -hmm. let's, we can talk a little bit more lifestyle. There's some interesting things I actually do want to talk about, but let's touch into the genotype, uh, thinking about the APO-E yeah. alleles. Um, has anyone in the room ever tested themselves for APOE, which is a, a genetic marker? There's a, uh, there's a sort of six different classes. You could be a, a there's two, three, and four, and within the APOE alleles, and you could be a, it's paired, so you could be a two, two, you could be a two, three, a two, four, a three, three, a three, four, and a four, four. So, so six different options. Um, and anyone in the room ever gotten themselves tested? So I, historically, I have never been tested. And until recently, I thought, why? I'm already live a healthy lifestyle. I'll do all the things I'm supposed to do. And so do I really need to get tested? So I'm going to ask the professional here, what are the reasons to get tested and should we get tested? I've changed my point of view since I've oh. held this belief, okay. but I'm open. Okay. <laughs> um, I will caveat, I'm not a genetic counselor, and this is a profession that actually exists. So I don't want to um, yeah. trample on them. So um, yeah, so APOE, you get one from your mom, you get one from your dad, so you get two copies. Um, there are three options. You can have two, uh, APOE allele two, three or four. Um, four is the one that has been associated with Alzheimer's disease risk. Two has actually been shown to be protective. Um, and then three, which is what most of us have, is just kind of... Um, control. Yeah. The norm. Uh, yeah, the, exactly. Our reference point. Yeah, and so... Um, the vast majority of people uh, with Alzheimer's disease do have an APOE4 allele, at least one. Um, having two copies is actually quite rare. Most people do not have two copies. Most people, uh, if they have it, they just have one. Uh, it is not determinative, like we mentioned before. So it, it, it does mean that um, it increases your risk by quite a bit. Um, like I said, most people who have Alzheimer's disease do have an E4 allele. Um, however, there are a lot of people who have an E4 allele, sometimes even two, who don't have Alzheimer's disease, and they can live into their hundreds and never develop Alzheimer's disease. And so that is where we start to think about lifestyle. There's, there's something that they did that may have reduced their risk. So as it comes to genetic um, testing, this is a really touchy subject, and I would say that it is so person-dependent. Um, on the one side, uh, if you know your risk, you can do absolutely everything to mitigate it. So if you know that you have an E4 allele, then maybe you're going to be extra diligent about getting hitting those exercise goals, or you're going to be extra diligent about making sure that you're getting restful sleep at night. The flip side of it is because it's not determinative, are you just going to be stressed out for the next 30 years? Um, and I clinically do see that. And so that's where I think I get a little bit torn. I, I do have patients come into the office who have tested themselves usually through 23andMe or one of these commercial um, testing uh, companies, and they forgot their keys once, and they all of a sudden have self-diagnosed themselves, and it is consuming. Um, if, if you feel like you have a risk and then you feel like you have just identified the first uh, symptom, it is consuming. And so I think there are people in which testing for this is not a good idea, um, and there are people where... They need to know everything and they will maximally use all of that information and it is their benefit. And I think for them, maybe knowing does help. Ultimately, we should always try to be doing the best that we can. And I think it's a really a personal question is, would would knowing more change your behavior? Would, right. would it actually? Because I think that that's what it comes down to. Yeah, that's a great. I like that point of view. There was a study done recently that showed my recollection is that amongst those that have an APOE4 allele 1 or 2, if they did lifestyle change, um, those folks had the biggest effect in reducing their risk of subsequent dementia. Yeah. So, you know, if that's a motivator, it's like if you are, you know, BRCA positive or check two gene, if you have these genetic mutations that be like, oh, I need to screen myself more frequently for colonoscopies or I need to do other things depending on what the genetic mutation is. Would you then do that? Now, the other response is just assume you have it. Yeah. And act accordingly. That's sort of, you know, so the the default mode. Um, so, and then would you act accordingly? So we touched on going back to that for a moment. Let's talk about that for a second. Um, so we talked on about alcohol. We talked about cigarettes. Talked about exercise. Um, we talked about. Let's talk about sleep. Yeah. And uh, and then there's a few others I want. Yeah. Yeah. So sleep is 
you know, probably tied with exercise as far as what can you do to protect your brain. And sleep is so important. Um, sleep is a time where your brain needs to repair itself from in the day. Uh, sleep is also the time where the brain clears amyloid. It clears really the garbage that's come through the day. And I tell patients, you know, if you're not sleeping, you basically let the garbage trucks take the day off. And so trash is just accumulating on your on your streets. Um, it is hard for any of us, whether you're 30 or 70 or 100, if you don't sleep well, you don't think well. And so you're going to have these acute effects of just not thinking clearly when you're tired all the time. Um, but we also know that prolonged um, sleep deprivation, um, prolonged insomnia is uh, associated with uh, increased uh, risk for all of the dementias. Um, and for a while, this was thought as maybe like an early symptom. And I think that that probably is the case, that there's some sort of change in the circadian rhythm. We're starting to see the, the hard drive um, in the brain start to go haywire a little bit. Things are, are getting off. Uh, but for people who are in their 40s and 50s and are, are poor sleepers in midlife, they also have an increased risk of dementia. And so we know that sleep is related to risk, and it doesn't seem just to be a, a, a consequence of the disease. Um, we usually say like seven to seven to eight hours is like the sweet spot that you'd want to hit for brain health. Under six is associated with increased dementia risk. Over nine is also associated with increased dementia risk. So this is not like exercise where the more the better. Um, if you're sleeping more than nine hours, um, that often suggests that there's probably another medical condition going on. Right. Um, sleep apnea being the most common. Uh, where you just have more need for sleep. But we also see that in sicker patients, they are tired more. And so there's a little bit of a confound there. Yeah. So two questions that come up for me around sleep. So one is, don't sleep enough. People want to take sleep medication. So Yes. And then the other is, sleeping so much, there might be either health issues that are sort of physical, but there might be emotional mood issues, such as yeah. depression, and which we know is associated with lots of other bad outcomes. Um, and which also is correlated with social isolation. So I'd like to talk to you about both of those. Let's talk about um, maybe social isolation first. We could save that the medication discussion yeah. for later. Yeah, social isolation is something that I think is becoming very popular because of the pandemic. That is where we experience isolation on like a, a really a, a national level. Um, and we saw rates of dementia go up dramatically. Um, I, I can speak to this just personally in our clinic. Um, people were left alone for a year, sometimes two years. They totally got off their schedule. They lost touch with their friends. Um, and the brain is really, it's like a muscle. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. And it's social connection is so important for just using the brain, coming up with words to express to a friend, experiencing emotions, sharing memories. So social connection is a an act, a cognitive activity. It is a um, a cognitively challenged activity that is important, um, but also the mood piece of it. That we know that uh, it's not just being alone because we know that people who live fairly solitary lives, but let's say they're they prefer that way, they do not endorse feeling lonely. They don't have the same kinds of um, increased risk for dementia. So it seems to be specific to the emotional experience of loneliness not being alone per se. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful yeah. comment because there's plenty of people that enjoy their alone time mm -hmm. and there's those that really say want to be with others and that, that loneliness peaks up. I remember a statistic around, and I don't know if, how accurate it still is, that I know loneliness apparently uh, increases your risk for dementia by about threefold. Yeah. And as, which is as strong as having that APO4 allele gene. Yeah. So everyone's so worried about their genes, but they forget about things like what we're talking yeah. about right now. Um, I, we'll, we'll talk about medicines. Let's say that for a little bit later. I want to talk about hearing loss, um, which yeah. I'm approaching 60. I'm starting to notice and I'm wondering what that means. So, uh, and what's the role of hearing aids yeah. in, and does that mitigate your risk? I am probably like a super fan for getting your hearing tested. So I, I send almost all of my patients to get their hearing checked if they haven't. Um, the relationship uh, between hearing loss and dementia is gigantic. Uh, and if you just do a quick Google search, you'll see, um, I mean, just in the New York Times, almost yearly in the past five years, they've published numerous articles about how hearing loss is maybe the most modifiable risk factor as it comes to medical conditions uh, related to dementia. 
Uh, we don't know why. And I think that that's an important um, caveat to say that there, this is, again, another chicken and the egg scenario. Um, the hearing center of the brain is located right beside the, the memory center of the brain. So there is an anatomical um, sharing here. So there is one hypothesis is that as that hearing center is not being stimulated, it, at, it atrophies, it shrinks, it's not being used. And so over time, its neighbors also start to shrink. Uh, and so that is one of the leading hypotheses is that it's causally related to this um, more rapid decline in thinking. And again, the greater your hearing loss, the faster you change. And so there does seem to be a relationship here. Um, the other uh, possibility is that, well, maybe Alzheimer's disease uh, is affecting, because of that anatomical spread, maybe it's affecting the cellular death at a, at a wider scale. It's causing hearing loss. Um, and so the hearing loss is actually a symptom um, as opposed to a cause. Um, a third, and again, going to the social isolation piece of it, is that a lot of times when people have hearing loss, they stop going out. Um, they stop going to those big dinners with friends because they can't hear them. They're embarrassed asking to repeat uh, themselves. And so they stop socializing or when they do go to dinner, maybe they just sort of sit there on their phone at the side of the table. They don't really engage in the same way. And so there's going to be a social component to it, too, that even if you're hearing information, if you're not engaging that information, it's not quite the same. OK, so get your hearing aids and get wear that hearing aids and wear that yeah. every day, even if you're not going out anywhere, wear them at home. Um, OK, so let's I'm curious about um, when we touch on the medications now. Yeah. So. What are there medications? Let's start. Maybe we can start with sleeping aids, since a lot of people want to use that and have been using it. Yeah. Uh, they use things like Benadryl. They use things like Trazodone. Um, they use a range of prescription medications, Ambien, for example, Sonata. Yeah. What do you think about those and the role? Uh, what do we know? What do we not know? Yeah. So um, within sleep medications, and this is always something that you should talk to your doctor about of what is right for you. Um, but we know that some of the sleep medications, specifically ones that have anticholinergic properties. So um, the chemical acetylcholine is the chemical that one of the chemicals that we know changes in Alzheimer's disease and um, levels start to drop. Uh, we don't know why it, uh, the levels start to drop, but we know that these medications, they impact acetylcholine levels in the brain. And we know that people who are on these medications um, in a more chronic way, so over the course of a few years, they're taking them more days than not, they're at substantially increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease specifically. Um, this is different than, let's say, you're traveling and, you know, you need to catch up on jet lag. And so you take it in a more isolated case that tends to not have the same kinds of effects. But when we're when you have a sleep problem and this is your band aid, um, it is really a big risk. Yeah. There's a recent studies done or maybe they're older now, actually. And the list of medications associated with increased risk of dementia was shocking. Yeah. The yeah. beers. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. 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 yeah it's shocking because um, most primary care doctors, unfortunately, don't know all. I mean, the, the list is gigantic. It's impossible to memorize. You would really need to be referencing it. And so we regularly get patients coming into our office for memory problems who are on these medications. Um, and it's uh, fortunately a fairly quick fix. We can get you off of one of them and just onto something safer. Um, but it's a problem because it's something that we're causing. We're, we're contributing to the risk at that point. Right. You mean we ask the health? We the healthcare. Right. Yeah, exactly. We are um, right. someone's coming in with less risk, and we're increasing it. Yep. Yeah. How about um, let's talk a little bit about sort of predicting. You're talking yeah. about amyloid clearance. Yeah. Um, there's this test that I heard about that's sort of in research phase, somewhat called I think it's C2N, and I think the name of the test I wrote down is precipity, um, and it looks at um, amyloid beta, AB ratios between something yeah. called AB42 and AB40. It looks at your A, O, E allele, your yeah. gender, and your age. Um, maybe we could speak into that a little bit. Do you know much about that? So um, I know very little about that specific yeah. test. I can speak about amyloid broadly, right. about what we know about amyloid imaging, because amyloid imaging is something that has become increasingly available, um, and it, it is used in, you can go to a hospital in San Francisco and, and get your amyloid measured. Um, amyloid is the protein that is found in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, however, amyloid is also found in healthy brains. And so it's not as if developing amyloid means that you have then developed Alzheimer's disease. 
there seems to be a threshold and that threshold is what we're still establishing. Um, and for that reason, we do not typically recommend that people go and get their amyloid measured because we don't totally know what to mean, what it means, um, unless you're, you're really high in the spectrum. And then we can say with a pretty high degree of certainty that this is Alzheimer's disease. Um, but if you're in that middle ground, is this normal or not? We don't know. Um, I believe the test you're talking about is, I think that's looking at um, spinal fluid. Is that right? No, they do serum now. Serum, serum. Yeah, they're, they're, it's not looking at brain imaging, though. No. Um, so I know that that's something that they're looking at as a, they're measuring, and they have found some risk reduction, I think, related to that. Is that right? Yeah, well, they're trying to look at, what's interesting is, do the ratios change? And I think it's looking at amyloid clearance, yeah. to your point, looking at 42 versus 40 and clearance rates. Um, so that leads into the next. So yeah. there's some interesting work that's being done. Um, what's really fascinating for me is a lot of these, I feel like, are independent markers that are really looking at metabolic health. And what I'm going to talk about, what I want to speak, lean into a little bit more about is biological age. So we have our chronological age, but that's honestly less relevant, in my view, than our biological age. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, you, you know, you've been alive, you know, I've been alive 59 years. And biologically, am I 65, am I 59, or am I 45? And there's new tests out that are looking at what we call methylation pathways. Um, there are other tests that look at a variety of clinical factors that look at, your, at different organ functions, as an example, look at your glucose and insulin levels, and then calculate a biological age looking at that. There's some work that's looked at telomeres as well, which is sort of mixed reviews about the data on that. But all these different ways of measuring. There's another one actually I'll mention that we're speaking with like, this group tomorrow out of Stanford that's looking at immune, your immune system and looking at the metabolomics of your immune system and then archetyping different types of patterns of the immune function and metabolites related to that that then may will parallel biological age. So all these different ways of measuring our physiology and how youthful or not youthful we are. And I think that some of these things we're talking about through that our conversation today really are a sort of indirect measurement of this, of our physiology. Right? There's one piece here, there's another piece there, and that we can look at that. So I'm, what, what I'm hopeful, what I want to engage with our patients around, and I'm hoping you'll be excited about, is like to say, okay, here's your risk for dementia, or here's where you're at in your current memory, um, brain health, let's call it. Let's do some stuff that we think is helpful, all the stuff you just talked mm -hmm. about today. And let's put a line in the sand where you are. It's like getting on the scale. How much do I weigh? What's my body fat? We do in, you know, we do body composition. So what's our body fat? What's our lean muscle mass? Here's where you're at. And a lot of my patients, when they're not in their best moment, don't want to get on the scale. And I say, that's the best moment because then you can do all this goodness and then look how much you've achieved. So it'd be fun to sort of do that yeah. with some of your patients. So the ones I send to you mm -hmm. will get their biological age. And then we'll then from that say, okay, this is where you're at from a cognitive perspective. We're making, we're making some suggestions. Let's then repeat this in three months, see how, what the improvements are from the clinical side. Let's see from the biological aid side. Yeah, I think um, what you're also just referencing is also cognitive reserve, yeah. which is basically all of these different factors that we're talking about is building the strength of the muscle of the brain. Um, we know that people can develop Alzheimer's disease and have no symptoms of it. And I think that's really important for people to be aware of that um, we may not be able to prevent the development of the disease. We may be able to prevent the symptom onset. Uh, and so we, we know that people will um, be living completely normal lives on autopsy. will find that they had Alzheimer's disease. All of the stuff that we're trying to do is to reduce the risk of symptoms. And I think that we can do that if people are really serious about some of these lifestyle changes, but it is difficult. Um, but cognitive reserve is so important because you have control over how strong your muscle is. Yeah, I, what I, what's interesting, and so the parallel I would say is for men with prostate cancer, a huge percentage of people on autopsy have prostate cancer in their prostate, but it never caused them a problem. They didn't know about it. And it's the same sort yeah. of thing, right? So you may have pathology in the brain, but I can remember you telling me, you know, you, when people come in, they're super smart. They have, you know, they're they're super on it. They have a high IQ. They're super engaged. They may have decrement. They don't even notice it because there's so much reserve there. Yeah. So that leads into sort of the softball question of yeah. who should we send to you? Yeah. What age is good? And what are your recommendations yeah. about sort of getting a baseline and why? 
So I mean, I think any certainly not anyone over age 60 should have a baseline just because you're entering the phase of elevated risk, right? The biggest risk factor for these conditions is age. Um, in your 60s is when that 60, age 65 is, is the, the age that we say that's when things really s- seem to start. Um, so anyone in their 60s or, or older should, should get a baseline. Particularly, though, um, people who are really bright, people who um, are high achieving, high functioning. The problem with diagnosing uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease in those individuals is, let's say they were functioning at the 98th percentile throughout their whole life. Super bright. They went to all of these great schools. They were really successful um, occupationally. Over time, they start to decline. Let's say they decline from the 98th percentile to the 60th percentile they've lost almost 40%, but they're still doing better than the majority of their peers. And so they go into the doctor and they say, I just don't feel as sharp as before. The problem is they're sharper than most of the other people that that doctor saw that day. And so the provider is gonna say, you know what? You're getting older. This is nothing to worry about. And so oftentimes those individuals don't get diagnosed until the disease is so advanced. Um, And the risk with that is that a lot of the newer medications that we're seeing being approved um, that are disease modifying or at least hi- hypothetically disease modifying, those are only approved for people in the mildest stage of the disease. And so getting an early diagnosis matters. There are a lot of people who want to just kind of bury their head in the sand when it comes to this. It's not really good for you, though, because there are consequences to these diseases for yourself financially, for your families, for planning. And so if there's anything that we can do to change your trajectory early, we should. Yeah. So uh, since speaking with you over the past year, I've really come to appreciate the the need for us to send our patients to get a baseline, to get a cognitive assessment. Um, So uh, yeah, I welcome that and I look forward to that. I know we just have a few minutes left. I'd like to serve up any questions that you may have in the audience here. And if anyone has um, that is watching live through Zoom. You haven't mentioned attitude. What's the role of attitude uh, on brain health? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this sort of relates to mood. Um, and by attitude, I'm assuming your your outlook. Is that what you're thinking? Um, I, I think largely, right? I think that the people who tend to see things the glass half full, who tend to approach um, the aging process um, in a more embracing way, tend to do better. Uh, patients who tend to expect that they're going to decline often do. Um, there does seem to be a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy here. And so I think that um, being being healthy, be, having your mood be healthy and uh, uh, having a, a good outlook to your own future matters. Um, one of the most predictive questions when it comes to mental health is hope. Uh, how much hope do you have about your future? Um, patients who don't have hope tend to fare the worst over time. And so I think hope is probably one of the most important um, emotional factors that we would want to think about. Yeah. Great question. Yes. Cannabis. Yes. So who's out there who's saying yay? (laughs) Yeah. So I'm going to bring that. Thank you for reminding me. I wanted to speak of that. So, um, or ask the question to you, um, Caitlin. So what's the role of cannabis? as people are using a lot for sleep, I look at it as harm reduction, like they were on Ambien, now they're on cannabis. That's an improvement in my view, Mm -hmm. but I'm wondering about its role as it relates to brain health. And then I'm wondering if you're asking, might it help brain function? So two questions. Yeah, so I agree with you about the risk reduction. I think the, the reality is that we're decades behind where we should be when it comes to medicinal cannabis. And so I think there's probably some stuff that we just don't know yet. Um, but we do know that a lot of these medications are bad. And so I think that the odds that cannabis is worse than these medications is probably pretty low. And so I, I agree that I think using it for specific purposes is probably good. Cannabis is just like anything else, though. Um, Things need to be used in moderation. Sometimes people use cannabis um, because they're depressed and lonely, and this is their their solution as opposed to going out and meeting with friends. And so I think it has to be considered when and how are they using cannabis? Are they using it um, adaptively or maladaptively? 
Um, as it relates to thinking specifically, we do know that actually there's probably some negative effects. Um, it does seem to be um, temporary, though. It, it seems to be while the cannabis is in the body. It doesn't seem to be causing damage. It doesn't seem to be related to, to your actual brain's health. Um, but we know that it can cause some slowness in processing, some weaker attention that tends to um, dissolve within weeks. Uh, and so it's certainly if it's treating a medical condition, it's it's good. Um, as it relates to, I have patients who um, actually have uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Um, we definitely don't know about how some of these newer drugs interact with these conditions. There's reasons to believe that it may be beneficial. There's also reasons to believe that, hey, this brain is really barely holding itself together. Do we want to introduce a, a new agent into it? Um, so I, I tend to be less pro-cannabis in people who have advancing disease. Uh, any Before we go to, uh, there's some other questions. Are, are there any on Zoom? We're okay. If anyone has a question or so that's watching live on Zoom, feel free to put that into the chat or the Q&A. Yes. If you're tested at 60 or 65, what does that test consist of? So what is, just to repeat it for those on Zoom, if you're tested at, at Regardless of when you're tested, for that matter, what does the comprehensive neurologic test look like? Yeah, it's a great question because um, the evaluation itself doesn't really differ that much if you're 20 or 80. And so the actual tests that we use, for the most part, are used across the lifespan. It's just our expectation of performance differs. So we expect someone who's 20 to perform differently than a healthy 80-year-old. Uh, and we have what's called normative data, meaning we've performed these tests on thousands and thousands and thousands of healthy people. So we know, generally speaking, what a healthy 70-year-old with a college degree looks like. We know how they should perform on these tests. These tests help us figure out where within that spectrum you're falling. Um, and we want you to stay on your own curve. And so um, for this kind of evaluation, it looks almost like you're going to school. You go into a room, you sit with the provider, you're there for a couple of hours doing a test where maybe they read a short story to you, a list of words, they have you build different designs or solve different problems. Um, there's no needles, there's no brain scans, there's no medications. It's a, a fairly painless process, though it can be frustrating to some. Um, but, but then from that, we can see within your age bracket, um, how do you look? And, and does your memory look better than your, your spatial skills, for example? These different tests map onto different brain regions so we can compare you to your peers um, but we can also compare different brain regions within your own brain to one another. And then the advantage of that, you have this baseline, and then yeah. I come back five years later, or we, we share a patient that I sent to, had sent to their group who then had an incident occur where he fell and hit his head and uh, had some significant trauma. He had, had been tested just prior, he was 80 years old, um, tested maybe a year prior to that, uh, and then he's coming back next week, week after, for comparison of, of um, assessment again. So tell it maybe speak. Yeah. That. So this specific vision, weeks had passed from when I tested him to when he had this medical episode. And so um, the reality is that life is messy and you kind of don't know what's going to happen. These evaluations aren't specific to um, predicting a disease, for example. They're for anything that affects your brain. So you have a head injury or you go in for that knee replacement and you come out of it and you don't feel like you've recovered. You still feel foggy and months have gone by. Um, or you have a, a small stroke and you're not sure if you've gone back to your baseline or not. Um, the advantage of a baseline is it helps us be objective about your brain. Our own uh, subjective experience of our abilities is often different than our objective uh, uh, performance. So oftentimes patients will come in and they'll say, man, I did terribly. And I'll say, you were in the 80th percentile. What are you talking about? And so we often will experience things different than reality. And as it relates to your medical care, that can be a little bit of a problem because sometimes we don't know if we've made a full recovery. Sometimes we think we've made a full recovery, but our, our family doesn't. They see something different. And so it's good for us to have some sort of data to say, actually, this is how things stand. Mm -hmm. And there's the, uh, what you alluded to, which is the opposite, which is people had an old event, like they had concussion. And then they've sent a few, few, a few patients to their group around this. They're really concerned about traumatic brain injury that they had. And then they go get tested and they're like, actually, you did great. And which is such a relief because people are worried about future uh, risk of memory loss, having, having that concussion. 
So we have time for one more question. We'll pull it off the off of um, the Zoom. If um, Adam, do you want to speak to it? Bring help. Hey. Okay. <laughs> what do I do personally for my own brain health? Um, great question. Um, I have yet to get my APO E for allele. Actually, it just came back. I got my APO E the testing came back. And I think if I remember correct, I'm a three, three. So I'm like as normative as you get. Um, the, um, but that took me a while <laughs> to finally get mostly out of curiosity. Not that that affects, uh, what I do. So, I do pretty much everything that's on the list. I hate to say it, but I do. I don't smoke. I drink pretty irregularly, as in not very often, uh, and not very much when I do drink. Um, I use uh, marijuana pretty infrequently. I sleep like a baby, thankfully. I'm good at compartmentalizing things. Um, I do pretty daily exercise. Um, I love to be social. Um, I try to stay intellectually engaged. Um, and I, um, I think that those are most of the things that I do. So I haven't really taken any supplements per se. There are a range of supplements. We didn't really get into them. You know, whether it's Bacopa for focus or Vinpocetine or Hupirazine A, there's a range of stuff out there that I've seen, I think has marginal benefit Ginkgo. It's worth looking at, but for people that are accelerating where there's not a lot of good alternatives, but I, I don't do any of those. Um, I'm really keen on this biological age factor. I really think it affects um, all parts of our systems, right? Whether it's our heart health, which is really directly correlated to our brain health, our joint health, our ability to move through time and space, our risk for cancer. Um, I think leaning into our biological age and what affects that, which is a lot of what I just spoke into. Also regulating sort of my glucose, right? How do I eat? Am I eating starchy, carby foods where my glucose is going up and my insulin levels are chasing it? Or am I trying to actually lean, you know, live a very cl more clean life? So um, I think that's an important piece too. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, so I think we'll bring the talk to an end. We are here for you guys, those that are here want to ask some more questions. We didn't get to everybody. I'm sorry. Um, but thank you for coming. We do this once a month here at Cavallo Point. A beautiful place please come if you're not live in person we welcome you to come here um, and we do it monthly and uh, we'll look forward to having you uh, next month so thank you so much for coming really appreciate the dialogue and the time and have a good evening i hope you enjoyed the show today we really learned a lot if you feel compelled and want to learn more please feel free to go onto our website and subscribe to our newsletter as well as come onto our contact list. That'll allow you to get informed about future webinars as well as our upcoming retreats and you'll have an individualized program to get the results you're looking for to optimize your health and your health span. Thank you for joining us today.